Hey, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you. I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into God's word. I also hope that you have some community around you that you can talk through some of these things with. And I wanna remind you that we are in the middle of our year in the story, which is really this deep dive into God's great story and our place in it. If you'd like more information about that or about our community here at Restore, you can get that all on our website at restoreaustin.org. We really would love to see you soon. Thanks. Many of you know that I got kicked out of church when I was 13. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, that's it. I'm done. No, no I'm just kidding. Um, I, I've said it a few times from stage. I've, I've talked about it over coffee with many of you. But I've never actually shared the story in its fullness. Like, what, what really happened? Why was I kicked out of church? So um, I've never done that publicly. Um, but that ends today. I, I want you to hear the story. So... Um, I grew up here in Austin, and I grew up um, in, in a couple of different churches that uh, the vibe that I got from them and the understanding of God that I got from them was that God liked you when you performed, right? That, that when you demonstrated yourself to be good enough or, or right enough or the right kind of person, then there was acceptance from him and there was acceptance from the church body. But Conversely, if you did not, then there was not acceptance from him, not acceptance from the church body. That was my understanding of God for a really long time. And as we transitioned to a church um, a little closer to our house, farther down south, um, I started to get into youth group age, right? Kind of 11, 12, 13, and junior high. And the way that our youth group worked, probably the way that a lot of your youth groups worked, is we had kind of a, a larger area, right, where we, we sang and, and kind of maybe there was a quick message, and then you, you broke out into smaller areas, and you had Bible study and discussion. And there was one time when we had broken out into this Bible study area and we were having this conversation um, where I, I just really didn't agree with what the youth pastor was saying. And to be honest, it wasn't just this one time, it was a lot of times that I didn't really agree with what the youth pastor was saying. At this point in my life, I would not qualify myself as, as a Christian. My parents were Christians, and, and I think my faith was really just kind of theirs, and I just latched onto it. They were, required me to go to church a lot of times and, um, because they're great parents, and they, they tried to lovingly show me the right way, right? But I, I didn't buy into a lot of it. I didn't buy into a lot of it. And because honestly, when you are presented with a God that likes you when you do good and doesn't like you when you do bad, there's really only two options for that. The one option is just to pretend that you're good all the time. Like Eddie said, right, if you think you're perfect, maybe that's your imperfection. And so that's one option. You, you, you kind of become this Pharisee like we see in Scripture, this person that just pretends to be good all the time, that puts on this face and, and tries to be accepted by God and by the church. Now, there's a second option, and that option is kind of just to say, to heck with this, man, I'm, I'm out. This is stupid. This is ridiculous. I can never live up to this. I don't even want to live up to this. So I'm I'm out. And I, I tell you, I, I took the, the second path. And I just didn't buy into any of it. I didn't agree with any of it. I, I would stay up late online looking up arguments for atheism and bring them to youth group on a weekly basis. And there was this one time we'd broken out into this Bible study that we were talking about Jesus on the cross, right? Right? And, and there's this passage in Scripture that, where Jesus, he actually quotes a psalm, and he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? It's a, it's a famous passage. You've probably heard it in church or in songs, even in popular music and television and stuff. It, it's a pervasive quote from Jesus. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And I remember we, we read this story, and I raised my hand. That's generous. I probably just blurted out, honestly. <laughs> I said, so God is just this terrible dad, huh? Right, like at his son's most important time of need, he just bails on him? Like how could you do that? How could you allow, how, how could you follow a God that when his son was in the most need, he just turns his back? Now I've come to understand that passage a lot more holistically and that that is not at all what was happening there. 
But instead of sitting down with me and, and talking through it or saying, hey, here's some, maybe some different ways to think about that, my youth pastor just said, get out. Get out. I'm tired of this. And so I went, I actually had a usual spot in the hallway that I went to. So I went to my usual spot in the hallway after being removed from Bible study. Again, this has happened a few times. But this time it was a little different because after Bible study was over, he came out and he said, Zach, you're going to have to sit here for a little bit until your parents get here. And when your parents get here, I want to talk with the three of you. So I said, okay. And so my parents get there to pick me up and, and our youth pastor grabs me and my parents and the four of us go into this room off on the side and he says, your son is no longer welcome at any of our youth functions. And my dad just kind of nodded. I think he understood. <laughs> uh, my mom said, why not? And he said, he's causing the other kids to doubt their faith. He's asking too many questions. He's doubting. And from that moment on, I was absolutely convinced that I had no place in the church that I had no place in God's family, that questions had no place in God's family, that doubts had no place in God's family, that I didn't have a place in the church, that I simply wasn't a good fit in God's family because I looked out at the other God's family members that I saw around me and I didn't look or think or act a lot like them. And I thought I must just not be a good fit here. And I carried that with me for a really long time. And I know that a lot of you have felt or do feel the exact same way. And here's how I know that to be true. Number one is simply the numbers. You see, in 2010, there was a survey done by the Barna Group, and they found out that four out of every 10 Americans who don't attend church reported not attending church because, quote, negative past experiences in churches or with church people. 40% of people who don't go to church don't go to church because of negative experiences with the church or with church people. That was in 2010. I don't think the numbers have gotten better. That's the first reason I know that to be true. Here's the second reason I know that to be true. It's because I know many of you personally because we have had coffee and drinks and lunch and we have shared meals together and, and I have heard your stories. I have heard your stories about how church or church people have hurt you and marginalized you and made you feel like you don't have a place in the family of God. And one of the most tragic parts of all of this is that a lot of times, when people are told they don't have a place in the family of God, it's usually from someone quoting a Bible verse at them, saying, hey, here's something that says that you, you, you really aren't a good fit here, that you really don't belong here. And that's why back in August, we started this year in the story. This time dedicated to understanding God's great story and our place in it. It's because we believe that understanding the Bible is more than just a collection of disjointed verses. It's absolutely vital to understanding the truth of God's story. Because unfortunately, many Christians' primary interaction with the Bible is ripping little verses out of their context and using them to prop up their own worldview. Or even other times, using them to keep people out that they don't want in. People that are different from them, that don't look or talk or act like them. This is why so many Christians and so many churches have constructed a God that looks and votes and acts just like they do. It's why their version of God likes the same people they like and doesn't like the same people that they don't like. And it's why so many of our churches are shockingly homogenous. But when we do that, not only do we pervert the meaning of individual verses, and not only do we completely miss the point of God's great story, but people get really hurt. People are made to feel like they don't have a place in God's family, in God's church. And that's why, as a part of our year in the story, we are taking these four weeks to find our place. 
Last week, we talked about finding our place in God's story. Where do we fit in Scripture? What applies to us? What doesn't apply to us? What covenant are we under? What covenants are we not under? If you missed that, you can go find that online. This week, we're shifting our focus and talking about finding our place in God's family. And you see, people have been made to feel like they don't have a place in God's family for a variety of reasons. Now, my goal this morning is not to tackle each and every one of those reasons. My goal is to step back and answer a larger, looming question, and that is, who has a place in the family of God? That's the question we're going to try to answer with God's word this morning. Who has a place in the family of God? Now, the family of God and the church are synonymous. Not a church, okay, so stay with me, this is important. Not a church, but the church. Because you see, the church isn't a building, it's not a ministry program, it's not led by a pastor, it's not relegated to any particular location or context or denomination. The church, as talked about in Scripture, is anyone who is a part of God's family. So the church and God's family are synonymous. I'm going to use them that way throughout our time together this morning. So when we ask who has a place in the family of God, the best way to find the answer to that question is by taking a look at how God's great story describes the church. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, you can open up there. You can go on your phone or iPad or anything like that. You can Go there, but there's also going to be verses on the screen behind me if you want to follow along. Acts chapter 2. But before we jump in, let me catch us up on where we are in the story. You see, Jesus, God in the flesh, has come to earth to be the Savior of the whole world. He lives this incredible life, right, marked by sacrificially loving and serving the world around him. He ends it by sacrificially laying his life down and then conquering death and rising from the grave three days later. After he rises from the dead, he appears to his disciples. And it's during his last moments with them, before he goes back up in to be, into heaven to be with God, he says this famous line from Acts 1.8. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Now, this would be the very last thing he says to them. Because moments later, he ascends into heaven, and then there's an angel there, and the angel tells the people on the ground, just like he ascended, he's coming back someday. He's coming back to finish his work of restoring all the broken people and all the broken places in the world to their rightful state. So now, all we have left is this small group of about 100 men and women who are still loyal to Jesus, his followers, his disciples. Led by Peter and Mary and a few other disciples, they start getting together every day to pray and wait for Acts 1-8 to come true. Then one day, it happens. The Holy Spirit comes upon them just like Jesus has predicted. And and the Holy Spirit starts doing these incredible things in them and through them. So incredible that they spill out of the little room that they had been praying in into the streets. And it causes this this ruckus, this commotion. So literally thousands of people come from around the city in Jerusalem. And they come and they're like, what is going on? They start asking questions. Peter, Peter, what, what is this? What's happening? And so when they ask, Peter gets up and he starts telling them about Jesus. And this is essentially the very first church sermon. And Peter starts it out by going back to a prediction about that very day from the Old Testament prophet named Joel. It's Acts 2, verse 16. Here's what it says. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In those last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's important, all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit is poured out and given to everyone. He's very specific. It's regardless of age or gender or status. This would have been outrageously taboo in this first century context and culture, y'all. I mean, like, ridiculously. This was a a totalitarian, 
patriarchy, right? Only men of a certain race and a certain status and a certain age could do many things in society. But God is saying, no, 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 no. We don't play by those rules. The church doesn't play by those rules. My Holy Spirit is poured out on everyone. The church is a family where everyone has a place. And he leaves no doubt about this in verse 21. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not everyone who looks like me will be saved. Not everyone who who sins the same way I do or who thinks the same things are sin that I do. Not everyone who believes exactly like I believe will be saved. No, 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 there aren't qualifiers in this statement. You see, it's God's party. He gets to make the guest list. He gets to send out the invitations. And the invitation he sends out could not be more clear. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus is welcomed into God's family with open arms. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus is welcomed into God's family with open arms. God's family is a radically inclusive and diverse group of people. As we work our way through the book of Acts and and we see more and more pictures of this church, we see God just continuing to grab people from the margins of society. People that had been ostracized, people that were totally different ages, races, genders. In fact, we see the church include all different age, race, gender, lifestyle, background, ethnicities, languages, education levels, and classes. There is no distinction. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Apostle Paul reaffirms this in his letter to the Galatian church. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and welcomed in to the family of God and given the Holy Spirit. You see, that last part is incredibly important because the Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. The Holy Spirit doesn't care who you are or what you've done or where you've come from. The the Holy Spirit isn't deterred by your age or your race or your gender or your socioeconomic status or your sexual orientation. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of everyone who places their faith in Jesus. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus. This has been a cornerstone of Orthodox Christian belief for thousands and thousands of years. God's great story could not be more consistently clear about this. Over and over and over again, it clearly states that everyone who places their faith in Jesus is welcomed into the family of God with open arms. Here's just a taste of it, okay? Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. 1 John 5, 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John 6, 47, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. John 1, 12, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Galatians 3, 26, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's just a taste. That's just a sampling of how consistently clear God is about who and who is not welcomed into his family. We are a part of the family of God by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. It is that simple, my friends. It's that simple. I said this before, and I am sure that I will say it again. 
But when you make anything more than faith in Jesus necessary for inclusion in the family of God, it's heresy. When you make anything more than faith in Jesus necessary for acceptance in the family of God, you are speaking heretically. It's antithetical to the truth of God's great story. It is in direct opposition to the teachings of Jesus. And I know this might sound strong, but y'all, I am convinced that it is evil to do that. It is evil to add anything but faith in Jesus as a necessary requirement to be a part of the family of God. And here's why. I cannot think of many things that God hates more than convincing someone he loves that he doesn't love them. I can't think of many things he hates more than that. In his letter to the Galatian church, Paul calls doing this a perversion of the gospel, which is really no gospel at all. That's what he says. I think it really comes alive when we remember that gospel literally means good news. So check it out. Galatians chapter 1. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, a different good news, which is really no good news at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. He hates it when we do this. Let them be under God's curse. So what is this perverted, not so good news that Paul's talking about? He explains it a few verses later. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, if righteousness could be gained from from morality or or being a certain type of person or or acting a certain way or, or becoming something that the church tells you that you have to be, then Christ died for nothing. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing in what you heard? Did you receive the Spirit by works, by doing something, by by acting a certain way, by being someone that you were told you had to be in order to be a part of the family of God, or, or by believing in Jesus, by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. That's it. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. The good news, the gospel, is that God loves us so much that he stopped at nothing to make a way for us to be in his family. Making it anything other than that is a perversion of Jesus' love, and it is no good news at all. Trying to build fences around God's family, trying to build walls around God's church is not only wrong, it won't work. God won't let it work. Like we just sang, there is no wall he won't kick down, no lie he won't tear down coming after us. As he pursues us with his love, he will stop at nothing. God will not allow anyone to put restrictions on his family. He won't do it. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus is welcomed into God's family with open arms. The church, God's family, is the most radically inclusive and diverse community of people in the history of the world. That's who they were in the first century. That's who we should be in the 21st century. We can't abandon the grace of God like Paul says. That's all we have. That's who we are. It's who we've always been. So let me say it as plainly as I can. If you've been told you aren't welcome in the church, you've been lied to. If you've been told that something about you prevents you from being loved by Jesus, you have been lied to. If you've been told that you don't have a place in the family of God, you have been lied to. And I am so 
so sorry. It breaks my heart to know that so many of you have been told that by people. Because Jesus would never tell you that. He just wouldn't. Scripture is so clear. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus is welcomed into God's family with open arms. Not begrudgingly. Not like, oh, I guess you believed in Jesus. I guess I have to allow you to come. He leaves the 99 sheep behind to go after the one who's lost its way. That's who our God is. He is so radically for you. He loves you more than you could ever, ever imagine. No matter who you are or what you've done. We see a picture of this at the end of God's great story. In the book of Revelation, John describes the radical inclusiveness and diversity of God's family when Jesus comes back to complete his work of of restoring all the broken people and all the broken places. In Revelation 7, he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's this guy named uh, Brennan Manning, who's one of my very favorite authors, and he wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel, Good News for the Bedraggled, Beat Up, and Burnt Out. A lot of you have heard me talk about this book. I've even given it out to many of you. And I love this book so much because it is such a beautiful picture of just how radically inclusive God's family really is. In my favorite passage from the whole book, Brennan references that diverse family of God standing before Jesus wearing the white robes from Revelation 7. And honestly, I I can't think of a better description of God's family than the one he portrays. And I can't think of a better way to end my time with you this morning than by just reading it over you. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it over you. I'm going to pray. And then this part of the gathering will be over. I would love for you to close your eyes, to just meditate on these words as I read them. And just full disclosure, I've tried to read them out loud 10 times this week without crying, and I am 0 for 10. Okay, so... (laughs) Prepare yourselves. I'm going to try to get through it. But just let this soak in. Close your eyes. Let this beautiful picture of God's family penetrate your heart and mind. Here we go. He says, Because salvation is by grace through faith, I believe that among the countless number of people standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palms in their hands, I shall see the prostitute from the Kit Kat Ranch in Carson City, Nevada, who tearfully told me that she could find no other employment to support her two-year-old son. I shall see the woman who had an abortion and is haunted by guilt and remorse but did the best she could with face with grueling alternatives. I shall see the businessman besieged with debt who sold his integrity in a series of desperate transactions. The insecure clergyman who, addicted to being liked, never challenged his people from the pulpit and longed for unconditional love. I shall see the sexually abused teen molested by his father and now selling his body on the street who, as he falls asleep each night after one last trick, whispers the name of an unknown God he learned about in Sunday school. But how, we ask, Then the voice says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There they are. There we are. The multitude who so wanted to be faithful, who at times got defeated, soiled by life, and bested by trials, wearing the bloodied garments of life's tribulations, but through it all, clung to faith. 
My friends, if this is not good news to you, you have never understood the gospel of grace. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the clarity you give us about who is welcome in your family. Thank you that we don't have to wonder, that we don't have to doubt, that we don't have to listen to those who would say that something about us disqualifies us from being part of your family. Thank you that everyone who places their faith in you is welcomed into your family with open arms. And I pray for anyone here this morning who has been told that they don't fit, that they don't have a place in the church, in your family, that you would wash those lies away. You would reveal your truth to them and you would let them know that they have a place in your family, that they have a place in the church and that they have a place in this church. Thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for the way you come after us. Thank you that there is nothing that gets in your way, that there is no wall you won't tear down, lie you won't break down coming after us. We trust you. We love you. We place our faith in you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.